Hi, I'm James Kilgo with South Carolina Rural Water Association, and I'm here with Mike George with American Flow Control, and he'll be talking about uh, hydrants today. Uh, so take it away, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to also introduce to the gang out there watching Joe and Paul. They're from Lexington Utilities in Lexington, South Carolina, and uh, after today, they have a great movie and film star career ahead of them. So they're going to be helping me out. When we were talking this morning about fire hydrants, we covered a lot of ground. And one of the things we talk about when we go out there to do our maintenance is to make sure that the nozzles are at the correct height. And as a pressure, that correct height, according to the National Fire Protection Association, is 18 inches. And that 18 inches is from the center line of the nozzle to the final grade. As you can see in this particular demonstration, we've got a hydrant that doesn't quite meet that criteria. So today we're going to come out here and put a 12 inch extension on this fire hydrant. During our conversation, we also talked about all the kits that are available in the fire hydrant business. And today on the ground, we have two of those kits that we discussed. The one with the uh, red traffic flanges is what we call a traffic repair kit. And the uh, right to the left of it with the extension pipe and the other parts and pieces are what we call an extension kit. You'll notice there are some differences in the number of parts that are included. So on a traffic repair kit, all we're going to get is a new set of bolts. We're going to get two traffic flanges since this is an American Darling hydrant and we're going to get a traffic coupling and one barrel gasket. When we go and graduate to the extension kit, you see we have some more parts and pieces. First we have the 12 inch extension pipe with the two flanges on it. And those are held in position by, or limited in the travel anyway, by the snap rings that are both ends of the pipe. We also have two barrel gaskets, bolts. Since we're raising it, we're gonna need a rod as well. And this is a 12 inch extension rod that goes with it. And since we're moving that traffic coupling, this coupling is at the current ground line. We're gonna move this Excuse me, this coupling's at the old ground line. We're moving it to the new ground line, so we're gonna have to have something below it to keep the rod together. So that's where this extension coupling comes in. I wanna call your attention to the fact that uh, on the extension coupling, there's a yellow warning tag on it that says this is not a traffic coupling, it's an extension coupling. And the other thing is the word top, T-O-P, is cast into the uh, top of the coupling just like it is on the traffic coupling so that for Joe and Paul and myself when we go to assemble this we know that that part of the coupling has to go to the top of the fire hydrant. Most of the time when there's a leak on a fire hydrant it's because the extension kit has been improperly installed and by that I mean the coupling is flipped upside down like I'm holding here and these pins that you see in the coupling, they may not be locked into position on the rod. So we're gonna have to make sure that that's all done correctly, otherwise the hydrant will leak. So we kind of cheated a little bit this afternoon in the sense that we, if we focus our attention over to the hydrant that we've already excavated around the fire hydrant so we can use uh, our wrenches freely without any trouble. We've also uh, cleared away the dirt so that we can access the traffic and ground flanges, bolts and fasteners. And we've, uh, we want to be safe out here and that's why you see the cones out here. We're all wearing our safety vests. And as an added precaution, we've isolated this fire hydrant by shutting down the isolation valve, the watch valve, uh, so that the hydrant is safe to work with. So the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna take our operating wrench and we're gonna open the hydrant. And we're gonna open it just enough to put a two by four between the lower barrel and the upper barrel to block it. The reason why this upper barrel is moving towards the sky here, moving upwards, is because of the line pressure. The residual line pressure is helping us keep the seal and also that spring we showed you in our PowerPoint. That residual line pressure in the spring is what's raising that barrel up. And now what Joe's going to do is he's going to find the lower coupling pin and clevis pin and remove it. I 
Okay. Just finished removing the lower coupling pin and the lower cotter pin on this particular fire hydrant. And so now we're ready to take the hydrant operating wrench off, remove the two by four from the hole. And then Paul and Joe will use teamwork and correct lifting techniques to lift the upper barrel completely off the lower barrel. Now we're going to remove the uh, lower barrel gasket. And uh, you can see this has a little bit different configuration than the black coupling on the lower barrel there. This is a epoxy primer that we use to cut down on the rust to make the hydrant easier to take apart. We also uh, eliminated the uh, cotter pins and now they're replaced with a clevis pin. And we've been doing that uh, since about 2008. So at this point, I'm going to hand you the coupling. We're going to remove first, not necessarily over the hydra, we're going to remove the pins. Just kind of pull and push. And when you look down at the lower rod, there is a notch in the lower rod, and we have to make sure that the hole that's in the lower part of the coupling lines up with that notch. The other way, Lisa. The other way. up on the coupling to make sure that the coupling, the lower part of the coupling is locked on and retained on the lower rod. This is our 12 inch extension rod. We're going to put that in the top of the extension coupling and then install the second coupling pin and clevis pin. Go to the middle, guys. There you go. And you'll notice that uh, Paul and Joe are making sure that the uh, both pins are faced in the proper direction so they don't have to flip back and forth trying to look for the clevis pins. Next step is we're going to put this lipped barrel gasket on the lower barrel. And the lip goes inside there, hang out on the outside. There you go. I'm going to hand these gentlemen the extension barrel. Now, the length of extensions in our industry, they are as short as six inches and can be as deep or long as 48 inches. As we talked about in our discussion, sorry about that guys. As we talked about in our discussion, one extension per fire hydrant. That keeps the rigidity in the rod so it doesn't flex or hammer. And right now they're dropping in the new lower uh, extension barrel bolts. These are all stainless steel. They're going to get these uh, hand tight to start. The torque at this point is probably about 75 to 80 foot pounds of torque on these particular bolts. And you'll notice that the, at the opposite end of the flange there, you'll see a shallow groove. That's for the remaining snap ring that I have here. And also, uh, when you're out there working on fire hydrants, make sure that you use the original manufacturer's parts for extension kits, traffic repair kits, maintenance items. 
So basically, you need to look for the logo of the company that is furnishing the parts for their hydrant. And so if you don't see the American logo on the box, or on the uh, kit, then it's probably not our kit, it's what we call an aftermarket kit. And the concern there is, since it's an aftermarket kit, they're not manufacturing it necessarily according to our standards as far as materials and um, the other engineering parts that go into creating that kit. And so we're more concerned about fit than anything else. And so, uh, getting that done there. Well, we finished tightening up the uh, bolts down there on the lower portion of the extension kit. And now we're gonna put the new ground flange on now. And so I'm gonna hand this over to Paul and he's going to slide it over the barrel of the pipe. Next we're going to attach the snap ring. And Paul, if you'll do me a favor and pull up the snap ring towards the top and up against the lock ring. There you go. You can see the ground flange rests up against that snap ring and that's what keeps, helps keeps everything together. Okay, we can let it drop back down. We're going to use our second barrel flange. We're going to put our 2x4 back into position, just like you had when we were taking it off. And now we're going to lower the barrel into the position, and then we're going to slide the remaining pin into the trap couple. Joe, you might have to lift up on it a little mm -hmm. bit so he can slide the pin in, but he'll let you know. Pull up on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got the top coupling pin and the top part of the coupling. And uh, Paul is putting the clevis pin back in it. And once he does that, we will remove the two by four and we'll use the operating wrench to bring the hydrant to the closed position. One added check, if you gentlemen would grab the uh, two hose nozzles yeah. and pull straight up to make sure everything's locked in place. One, two, three. Perfect. So you can see we did a check to make sure the pins were properly engaged by pulling up on the upper barrel. Now we can remove the 2x4 and we can close the hydrant back down. And Joe, as we get close to that gasket, try to keep the upper barrel centered so we don't move it out of position. And whatever you do, you don't get hit with the wrench. <laughs> okay. All this, uh, we have no water spraying everywhere because the line pressure is what's helping us keep the main valve shut off. Tommy needs to come a little bit to you if you'll open it back up. And pull it towards a little bit towards Joe. Open it up a couple more turns. Can you feel it come up? Okay. Well, we got to keep that gasket centered, everybody. See, we've got how the gasket is thin on that side and thick on the others, we need to push the upper barrel towards Joe. There you go, a little more towards Joe. Okay. Yep. Good to go. You all have the nozzles where you want them? Yep. Okay. Just close the hydrant down. When the wrench spins free, Paul, it's shut off. Okay, back it off a quarter to a half. There you go. Okay, now we have the two 
traffic flanges, they come in two parts. You'll notice that the weak point on the flange is the notch that you see here. So gentlemen, when we put them on, put them on like this and make sure that we try to keep that gap together as much as we possibly can. You see these two bolts on each flange? Those are the four bolts we'll put in first and get them hand tight. I'll help you out with the bolt part of it. I'm over here acting like a diva. As you can see, we're putting in four of the bolts, and you'll notice that where the halves come together is right below the discharge nozzle on each side of the hose nozzles. We're maintaining that tight gap there, and they're finishing up tightening those first. And we're going to alternate tightening these bolts. And at this point on the traffic and ground flange, that's only about 60 foot pounds. And it's we want to make sure that the ground flange is not cocked in any way and that the traffic flanges stay flush so that they don't get out of kilter and if we put too much torque on them, we could break them. Which would be what it's supposed to be. Those two traffic flanges are made out of gray iron and that's the part that's supposed to fracture when the hydrant is hit. And when the hydrant is hit, everything that's red will be laying in the grass and once again, that line pressure will keep the main valve shut up against the seat and we won't have water spraying everywhere. So when you're out there at the movies and you see a movie star clip a hydrant, that is a wet barrel fire hydrant. We showed you that in our presentation. That's the hydrant has uh, water in the barrel all the time. And for each corresponding nozzle, there is an operating nut and stem that goes with it. And you notice on this hydrant, it's what we would call a three-way hydrant with two two and a half inch hose nozzles and one four and a half inch pumper and there's only one operating net and that's at the top and so now they're positioning the remaining six bolts into the uh, traffic flange the wrenches are right there by the there you go So basically when we're talking about torque requirements on bolts up here at the uh, housing and the upper barrel flange and down there at the lower barrel at the, these bolts here are about 75 to 80 foot pounds. The ones at the traffic flange and the ground flange are 60 and the ones below grade coming off the uh, existing lower barrel, those are also at 75 to 80 foot pounds. And you're noticing that they're alternating which bolt they're tightening, that's to make sure that we keep everything level and that we have equal torque on all the bolts. And when they're done, we want to be able to look at the number of threads that are below the fastener or the nut and make sure that we have the same number of threads per bolt below the nut. How's it look, guys? For GIS purposes and maintenance purposes, you'll notice here on the pumper nozzle, they do have a, a tag with the number on it. So when they're out here doing their hydrant maintenance to make sure the hydrant opens and closes and everything's lubricated properly, they can note the hydrant number, the address and location on their hydrant card and fill out the maintenance report. In today's case, we put a 12-inch extension on this fire hydrant, so on the maintenance card for that fire hydrant, we need to note that this 3.5-foot trench fire hydrant has a 12-inch extension on it, which now makes it a 4.5-foot trench fire hydrant. So we're finishing up that last one there. How's it looking over there, guys? You give me the thumbs up. Awesome, okay. So before we do anything else, we wanna check for leaks. And when we're looking for leaks, when we turn the water back on, we're gonna be looking for leaks up here at the operating nut where this weather shield is located, at all the bolted connections here at the uh, housing, and down here at the traffic and ground flange, and below grade at the extension flange. And we're also gonna be checking for leaks at the nozzles, especially at the caps 
and uh, where the nozzles are retained in the fire hydrant. This is a, an AMLOC nozzle that's on this fire hydrant. And that was the first fuel replaceable uh, nozzle in the industry. So if you gentlemen will be kind enough to turn the water back on. You want to flush this? Okay. We won't fill it up. So if you'll do me a favor there, Paul, and just crack that nozzle. Just one or two turns. That's good. So when we go to operate a fire hydrant, we want to make sure that we're not standing in front of the nozzle. So open that all the way up, Joe, and step away. And this is a six inch isolation valve. And so on a six inch gate valve, that's probably about 18 to 20 turns, plus or minus two turns. And we're going to open the valve into the full open position. Once again, when we're operating the fire hydrant, stand directly behind it. Don't stand over it. Make sure you don't stand in front of any of the nozzles. And we're going to open it enough to bleed any air out of it. Once the water starts spraying out of the cap, Paul will tighten down the cap, and that's when we'll do what we call a hydrostatic check, where we're looking for leaks at those bolted connections. Notice that Joe is uh, opening the valve slowly, which is what we want to have done here. Those are us watching these turn in slow to not create a water hammer. when you see the water spray out of the cap, that's when you can tighten it down and open the hydrant up the rest of the way. It takes 18 to 21 turns to fully open and close a fire hydrant. The drains on this fire hydrant flush during the first and final one and a half to three turns. As a general rule, as we talked about in our discussion this morning, hydrants, uh, drains will flush as a general rule during the first and final four to six turns, you can tighten that cap down. And you see we got some leakage up there at the top, so we need to tighten those bolts down. Okay, so we had some loose bolts on this one, and as you can see by tightening the bolts back down, we stopped the leak. It was just a little loose. Is the hydrant open all the way, John? Not quite yet. all the way. We've got the drain slushing right now. So when we're out there doing our maintenance, we're checking for leaks. We've got a leak on one of the hose nozzle caps. We'll have to go to our maintenance kit to get the uh, hose nozzle cap gasket and just replace it. A very minor thing. Once again, Joe is a master at opening those things. He's at the right cycle there about. Do the Mississippi. One Mississippi, two Mississippi when you're counting those turns. Okay. That's good. So we've got no leaks. 
And now we're going to close the hydrant back down. Joe, you'll hear the drains flush in a minute. Stop and let them flush for 15 seconds, and then close them down. This hydrant's on a cul-de-sac, and that's why we're taking a little more care to not create a water hammer. Drains are flushing, we can hear them flushing at this point. We're letting them flush for 15 seconds. And so now that they flush for 15 seconds, we can close the hydrant down. And when the wrench spins free, the hydrant is shut off. And that's a feature on our hydrant to make sure that we're not putting any tension on the rod or on the lower valve components to compress them and cause them to leak. So when you're done operating, make sure that you can spin that out nut about a quarter to a half turn and you're good to go. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. We're gonna fill in the hole and call it a day and find some shade and a cold drink. Take care and God bless.